name's Jamie and I'm with Green Iowa AmeriCorps and this is our week three summer camp and this week we are talking about ecosystems. Today's ecosystem is the Chia Fen which you can see here behind me. It's a unique Iowa habitat in that it is one of only two that we know of in Iowa. The other one being Dead Man's Bog up in northwest Iowa. What's cool about this habitat is that it is completely surrounded by a hillside and so we only get a very limited amount of rainwater in here. So all this water we see has all been brought up by rainwater. And we get a unique formation of plants and animals in this habitat. So if we walk out here, we can see a couple of unique wetland plants. Right here we have what's called the arrowhead. This is a plant that only grows in wetlands and it looks like an arrowhead. The Native Americans love these plants. One of the other things we get is sphagnum mosses. That is a characteristic of a bog. Um, we can't see any here right now, but we haven't gone out very far. What's cool about bogs is that there is no decomposition happening here. This is all stagnant water. And what happens is all these plants year after year, they will lay down and die and just keep building up on top of each other, continually forming what's called a peat mat. Now a peat mat is just a clump of decomposing plant litter like this. And it slowly decomposes, slowly, slowly building up. So something like this could take thousands of years to form. But the neat thing about peat mats is that they literally can float on the water. So all of this, all these plants you're seeing here, they're all floating on the water on this peat mat. And if you watch this, you can see how it ripples. I think that's really cool. One of the other neat things about bogs is that they are one of the few places where carnivorous plants grow. And the reason for that is because a bog has very little nutrients. So what the plant needs to do is it needs to catch bugs in order to gain nutrients. And that is how it survives in something that this that is this nutrient poor. Now I mentioned that the geology earlier, and you can see that we have this rim surrounding us. And so there's no fresh water coming into here. And what that means is that we only have very limited supply of water here. So what makes the geography of the GFN special? Well, first we have to look at, it's at the top of a hill inside of a depression here. And this depression is surrounded by impermeable soil and clay called an aquitard. And that keeps the water that is coming in stuck. That, that water has nowhere to go. There's no drainage and there's no other place for fresh water to come in other than from the rain. So what happens here is this hole is a good habitat for either frogs and plants to grow and the plants will keep growing and using up all the available nutrients which makes it an acidic ecosystem. So as the plants are growing they're dying and creating more of a layer here in the hole and this layer keeps filling up and filling more and more with peat, which gives it that wavy texture that we saw earlier. So now, like I said, only rainwater can come in here. There's no fresh water, no streams or groundwater that is getting into this. So that's what makes it a bog. If it were a fen, like its name is, then we could take out this portion right here and we might assume that either some groundwater is, is swelling up or we could take out this portion right here and say that groundwater or a stream is coming in to the system and giving it more fresh water which would make it more basic and then it would become a fen. So in this bog we have a lot of vegetation here. We have a lot of algae and duckweed. It's all this little green stuff floating at the top. And what happens here, there's a lot of respiration going on. So all the action that's in the water is being sucked up by these plants. 
And that means it's not good for other animals to live in. So this pond probably doesn't have any fish in it or any other animals that live fully in the water. But what it does have is a very good habitat for amphibians like frogs and salamanders because they can breathe air and water. There's also a lot of insects flying around, feeding off of other insects and off the vegetation. And as you can hear, there's also a lot of wetland birds, such as blackbirds. There's some cuckoos out here, some woodpeckers and sparrows. And it's, it's a very, even though it, it's a lot of stagnant water and not a lot of minerals and nutrients, there's still a lot of life that can live out here. Now that we are going to be talking about floodplain dynamics and why they're important for our ecosystems. So we're here at the Cedar River. This is up right next to Solon and Sutliff Cidery. And we have the river, which is getting a little bit high, but it's not quite flooding yet. But you can see all around us here is what we call the floodplain. And you can see how some of the plants are laying down flat. That's because they've been washed over by water previously. So to be living in this type of ecosystem, you need to be very resilient to a lot of changing weather conditions. Either we have flash flooding or we have dry conditions like we have now. So these plants are built for both. And when it floods over, they'll be submerged for a little bit, but then they'll come back up and be fine. And that's the way a lot of these trees are too. We have a lot of cottonwoods or silver maples. We have some box elder and these are very flood tolerant trees that we like to have around here on the rivers. Now the important thing for the floodplain is that the rivers by themselves are not very nutrient rich. It's a lot of fast moving water, a lot of the nutrients are suspended and they're not freely available for plants or any animals to use. So what happens is when the floodplain is washed over, a lot of the nutrients that are stuck in the ground here get brought back into the river system to be used up later. So right here is one of the cottonwood trees, and you can see it's very big. They grow very quickly. They're like a weed tree, and they will grow. They only have about a 75-year lifespan, so they get big very quickly, and they can get tall and crowd out all the other competition around them. So we're at one of the channels here in the floodplain for the Cedar River, and the channels here make very important environments also. There's a bunch of different characteristics. So the one thing we can see that there's some pools out here, which are called what we call ephemeral pools. And that means that they come and go with the water cycles. So when there's a lot of water, these pools will fill up and be full, kind of like little mini lakes. And when it's dry, we'll get what we see right here, where there's a little bit of water, some dry sand, some wet sand. And this supports a lot of different lifestyles that we can see out in the floodplains, which supports a lot of different animals and plants. Another thing that floodplains do is that they're very large compared to the river itself, but they're just as important. So we can see out in the distance there how far this floodplain actually goes until you see the hill there. And what's this, what this is doing is it's, it's filtering all the water that's coming down from that farm field and removing a lot of the excess nutrients and fertilizers that are being put on the farm. So it's very important to keep our rivers healthy so that we can keep these pollutants out of the river from going downstream. So we're here at City Park in the city of Iowa City, and this is a spot which is known to flood regularly. So we can see it's already flooding a little bit from recent rains that we've been having. And as you can see behind me, you can see Mayflower, one of the dorms here, and they've built a flood wall there to protect it from flooding. In 2008, there was a really big flood that came through Iowa, and Mayflower is one of the places that was damaged by this flood. So in order to protect it from that, they built the wall. But if we would have just not built on a floodplain in the first place, it would reduce the need to have to change a river system like this. So now what's happening here is that when it floods, which is a natural occurrence for flood or for rivers, which is what the river needs, it's, it's losing access to the nutrients on that side of the river, and it pushes more water onto this side, 